I'm the Dean of the College of Engineering here at UW, and I'm happy to welcome you to uh, our lecture series. I have up in front of you uh, the college website. I put it up there for two reasons. One is uh, that it's new, and we hope that you drive uh, through the website. We have lots of information for alumni and the community, and also related to uh, faculty research, departments, academic programs, and et cetera. So please drive the new website, and let us know what you think. Because we really are open to your feedback about ways to change it. I'm also using this because I want to introduce two things. One is uh, uh, two pieces of tonight's lecture. One is, is the uh, Back to Nature, the Next Technology, and Bobak, who I'll, I'll um, uh, introduce in just a second. But uh, the bionic contact lens was recognized, his, his work recently in Time Magazines is one of the best inventions of the last year in 2008. When I was talking to him before uh, the event, I just found out he literally flew back from Finland three hours ago, where he just won a uh, famous prestigious award from Nokia. Uh, so uh, he's doing OK. Uh, and the other piece of this, which is up there, is that's it. That's the bionic uh, lens. So when you're scrolling through the website, hopefully that will entice you to see some of that work he's done, but also the work of others in the college who are doing exciting things. Um, the second piece is, is this is Bobak's uh, web page from EE. And rather than give a formal introduction, I thought I'd use this. First of all, that is one cool tie. Uh, actually, when was the last time you wore a tie before tonight? <laughs> Been a while. My vision of EE professors does not include that quality of a tie. So thank you, Bobak, on that. Um, the second piece is you can look through this. I heard I was in Michigan a long time before coming here, and I had heard of Bobak uh, there, and his work was spectacular. Uh, he also uh, did a postdoc in chemistry. He is an electrical engineering professor, a postdoc in chemistry at Harvard. But I think by far the singular most impressive piece of his resume is this last piece right here. OK. And that was awarded two years ago? About two years ago. So he came here as a professor in electrical engineering and decided to enhance his educational experience by getting a bachelor's of arts degree in English literature. So I think that is the best way I can think of to introduce tonight's speaker, Bobak Barwitz. Bobak, go on up. I'm not sure where you are. Thank you very much, uh, Matt, for the kind introduction and not embarrassing me too much. Uh, <laughs> compared to Matt's normal standards, this is mild, so thank you. Um, it's uh, certainly a pleasure to, uh, to be uh, with you this evening and have the privilege of uh, sharing with you some of our uh, recent uh, research work. This is um, a rather informal, uh, informal talk, and uh, the, the plan we have uh, this evening for, uh, for this presentation is as follows. So very quickly, I have a one slide uh, history of manufacturing, basically uh, looking at where we've been uh, and how things have changed in the, in, in the manufacturing domain. And we're going to talk about uh, one case in uh, a bit more detail, and this is the case of uh, microelectronics, the electronics industry. And that sets the stage of uh, us looking at what is it that we may need in the next uh, 10, 20, 30 years? What is it that we expect from uh, engineering to deliver. And then we uh, spend the rest of this presentation on, on possible solutions uh, to these needs. And one particular solution that we have is uh, based on self-assembly. It's, it's a process that uh, occurs uh, very uh, frequently in nature. And we'll talk about some examples of how we can engineer self-assembly processes. So how has uh, manufacturing evolved uh, in the past uh, few years? Let's go back 200 years. So if we uh, look back at how we were doing things 200 years ago or so. Uh, we were doing things actually rather slowly with not a whole lot of precision. So this is the typical blacksmith that would uh, make one object at a time. This was the state of the art about 200 years ago. And this is by no means a co complete history of manufacturing. But one of the important things that happened uh, was around the turn of the previous, uh, previous uh, century, the turn of the 
uh, 20th century, and this is um, Henry Ford's uh, revolution in putting things together, the, the assembly line. So this allowed us to construct things like the uh, T model Ford automobile that had a few thousand parts uh, pretty efficiently uh, and making it available to the public. A very important, actually, step uh, uh, forward in manufacturing. And then if we go forward about 50, 60 years, um, or 70 years, we have what is probably right now the dominant and uh, most complicated things that we can, we can build. So either in aviation, we have Boeing in town, so these are extremely complicated uh, man, uh, engineered uh, structures that they build, or, or semiconductor devices. So these things, as engineered structures, have millions to sometimes billions of parts. So this is what we can do today. And the question is, what is the next one? If you're going to continue this trend and put, uh, keep putting zeros in front of the number of parts that go into a system, uh, how would we make them? How would we put, uh, put really complicated things uh, together? Now, in terms of history, uh, let's look at one of these cases in a bit more detail and see how this has evolved. And uh, in particular, I would like to talk about uh, the semiconductor industry, because I know in the audience we have uh, some people who are quite involved in this. So this has been uh, the electronics industry, the semiconductor industry has been one of the, the most impressive uh, uh, progress curves that we observed in the past uh, few decades. This is um, a curve from Intel, and this, is, uh, this, this type of progress is not unique to Intel. Uh, you know, we have uh, Cypress, we have other companies that have also contributed to this uh, uh, exponential growth. And what we have here on the, on the x-axis is the years, so we're going back about four, uh, 40 years, four decades. And uh, on the y-axis, we have the number of devices that go into one of these uh, electronic uh, uh, systems. This, in this case, is a microprocessor. And you can see that this is an exponential growth. So if I go back uh, 40 years or so, the state of the art had a handful of devices, uh, transistors, maybe 1,000, 2,000, 3,000. But now, right now, actually, we have... Uh, Integrated circuits that have one billion, close to one billion parts. That's a lot of parts. And uh, it's quite impressive that actually engineers can put the things with this level of complexity together. Now, we all know that these, uh, these are also tiny devices. The whole thing, uh, a microprocessor is not going to uh, occupy a large area. So if you're going to uh, fit one billion of these uh, somewhere, uh, we have to be able to uh, make the individual components very tiny. So how, how has that changed in the past? Uh, few decades. Again, going back to the late 60s, this is the, the, the invention of the planar uh, integrated circuits. The, the typical dimensions of these devices also have dropped exponentially. This is very impressive, and this trend is continuing still. To put this in perspective and see how small these, uh, these devices are, I would like to point out to two, uh, two points in this graph. One is um, around the 19, early 1970s. Uh, we could make devices with few micron feature sizes. And this is comparable to the size of a red blood cell. So normally we don't connect the semiconductor industry to biology, but this is the, the size scale of these, uh, these devices. And also quite interestingly, uh, uh, around, the, around the year 2000, sl uh, slightly actually past the year 2000, we began to uh, build devices that are now smaller than a typical virus. So we've uh, passed the 100 nanometer uh, size scale. We can make really, really tiny devices. These are pretty, pretty impressive. Now, if we are going to uh, make systems that are made of a billion parts, we'd like the part also to be quite uh, cheap. Otherwise, the entire system cost is going to skyrocket. Uh, I'll uh, show you one, uh, one graph here. Uh, this is the cost of um, a typical transistor over the years, again, in the past uh, about 40 years or so, and you can see that this is also dropping exponentially. This is quite important. Uh, this is what uh, has enabled access to sophisticated technology to a large number of uh, people in the world. Uh, we started by a dollar per transistor uh, when integrated circuits were invented. Now uh, it's hard to even count the number of zeros after the decimal point. So this is uh, the reduction, a very impressive reduction of, uh, of cost. I have one figure to also convey the complexity of these devices a little bit further. And this is a comparison of a very old, uh, old microprocessor, an old circuit, and a satellite image of uh, Buenos Aires. And if you step back and don't look at the details too much, they kind of look similar. So what, uh, what you see here is the complexity of these, uh, of these devices. So you're really making, making things today. This is the state of the art. So it's not science fiction. That have billions of parts. 
And they're similar really to uh, building, uh, building cities uh, in, very, uh, in postage stamp size uh, area. So it's a pretty impressive, impressive technologies. So our, uh, our wish list so far of a manufacturing process uh, involves the following. So we would like to be able to make small, uh, small components with nanometer scale, maybe tens of nanometer uh, uh, size scale dimensions. We would like to be able to put uh, billions of components together to make a complete system. And we would like to, to have the cost per component to be exceedingly small so the whole system is, is affordable. So these are, these are trends, and we would like to continue these trends and improve on them. Um, however, this is not the whole story. There is another very important trend uh, happening. And I think it's best, uh, since we mentioned Nokia, it's best uh, to see this in the context of uh, cell phones. So I have two pictures here. One is uh, Martin Cooper. Anyone here knows Martin Cooper? He's the, he's the, he's the person that invented cell phones. So it's from 1973. Uh, uh, well, this picture is not taken in 1973, but the, the cell phone is the 1973 cell phone. This is the first cell phone. And uh, it's interesting to see what this cell phone did about uh, 35 years ago. Uh, it was a revolutionary device, uh, definitely, and uh, primarily did one thing. It carried voice over uh, radio f uh, frequency waves. Pretty impressive uh, accomplishment. Now let's fast forward and look at Steve Jobs and uh, the fa very famous iPhone. I'm sure a lot of you uh, are carrying the these phones in your pockets. And see what this phone does. Obviously, it does what uh, the previous one was uh, doing. So th the main function of carrying voice over, uh, over radio frequency waves is uh, still happening. But it does also a lot more than that. So not only uh, this is a telecommunication device uh, for voice, it can handle data, it can process data. So there's a lot of computing power also incorporated in this device. It has a lot of uh, multimedia capability. It has a color display, has a, a touch screen capability. In terms of uh, sophisticated optoelectronics, it has a camera. It has uh, accelerometer, so if you turn the phone, the, the screen also turns. It does a lot more than electronics. And this is a trend that we're observing more and more, that uh, systems are not pure electronics anymore. They're supposed to do a lot more than just electronics function. So you have a lot of optical function, uh, uh, inertial sensing, uh, and uh, perhaps actually in the, in the next few years, uh, sensing biological uh, parameters and environment will be added to cell phones too. So we, we expect a lot of these cell phones. And uh, the question is how we construct something that is this, this complicated. Because all these parts, although we can make the parts, uh, they're, very, uh, they're made in very incompatible processes. So we need uh, methods to put microsystems together that can do a lot of different uh, types, of, uh, types of functions. So if we look at a device like this, how do we put it together today? Right now, we use robots, actually, to put uh, these systems together. So you take a robot, you give the robot all the parts, and the robot would assemble a cell phone and uh, would de deliver it. And the question is, what is the, what is the efficiency of a robotic, uh, robotic system? So I have a very non-scientific curve here that uh, delineates the efficiency of a robotic system for putting something together. On the x-axis, I have the size of the components that uh, you're trying to manipulate. And they could be very large, maybe a meter-sized part, or it could be very tiny. So down here, we're talking about the atomic scale. So this is a logarith logarithmic scale. And uh, on the y-axis, I have the efficiency of robotic systems for handling and uh, putting things together. So if we think about really large parts, uh, we have robots in the automotive industry that put things together. So they can handle maybe uh, tens of parts, uh, parts per hour. As the parts get smaller and smaller, it turns out that robotic systems become more efficient. So the state-of-the-art robotic systems, uh, this is a few million dollar system that you see up, up there, they can handle parts that are sub-millimeter, maybe uh, hundreds of microns, uh, five, six hundred micro, micrometers, and they can handle uh, tens of thousands of them uh, per hour. They can move so fast that the human eye cannot actually follow the robotic arm. But those are the types of systems uh, used today to assemble something that, like the iPhone, some, uh, something similar to that system. So this is a good trend because uh, we would like to put the uh, multifunctional systems together. We know that these are made of uh, increasingly smaller, smaller parts, uh, and the efficiency se seems to go, go up. But the problem is, if we go even to smaller parts, and we know this trend is going to happen, uh, the efficiency of robotic systems uh, drops. 
And if we start handling parts that are about 10 microns or so, it's possible to handle them, but unfortunately, because new forces come into the picture, and also the computing uh, and control of these systems become more uh, difficult and expensive, the efficiency drops. The extreme case is uh, manipulating atoms one by one. So the question is, can I get a robot? This robot would take one atom, place it in the right location, and then take the next atom and, and continue like that. And the answer is yes, you could do that. And this is an actual image of, uh, I believe xenon uh, atoms on copper, and each one of these dots is actually an atom manipulated with an STM tip, essentially a robot, to spell IBM. So state-of-the-art actually can do things like this, but uh, this will take forever. So unfortunately, this will never be able to manufacture anything in, in, a, in a large scale. So we still have the problem. You know, we, uh, we've identified what we need uh, for a future manufacturing process. We would like to be able to make really small parts, small meaning comparable probably to the size of molecules and atoms. Uh, we'd like to be able to handle lots of parts, uh, many billions and more. And uh, we would like to be able to put parts together very quickly and efficiently. And uh, we see that unfortunately robotics is not going to be able to do that. So how do we do this? What is going to be the next manufacturing method that can answer our questions? So in order to answer this, uh, we looked at nature and uh, we attempted to see how complexity develops in nature. So what I have here on the, on the left side is examples from nature, on the right side, their size scale. And at the bottom, we know that there are atoms available in, in nature. This is an example of a picture of uh, uh, carbon atoms. And the uh, typical size of these is uh, about one angstrom, so it's 0.1 nanometer. And what nature does is that nature puts atoms together to make uh, small molecules. So there's now the size of the object is increasing, and also complexity is slowly increasing. This uh, small molecule is a co collection of atoms. And then it puts uh, small molecules together or make, uh, would make more, more complicated molecules. It's an example of uh, a protein. And some of these proteins are really machines, so they can do, uh, do various, uh, various functions. And then if you uh, put a collection of uh, small and larger uh, proteins to, uh, and other molecules together, you may make a cell. So now the size, again, is increasing. Now we're at the, about a micron, so it's one meter divided by a million. And you could put cells now together to make uh, simpler um, organisms, maybe, something similar to this uh, uh, fruit fly. Or if you, uh, if you continue the complexity uh, hierarchy, you get to the most uh, complicated uh, system that we're aware of, and this is the, this is the human body. But you can actually see how gradually from the, from the ground up, uh, nature uh, develops complexity, starting with very simple components, atoms, and then going to uh, increasingly complicated molecules, eventually to, to full systems. And the question is how nature does it. We know that this is happening around us all the time. Every person that you see is made this way. Uh, every tree that you see is made this way. So how does nature do it? How does uh, nature make something exceedingly complicated, uh, similar to a human body? Uh, we know that there's, uh, there's no robot that we're aware of that uh, there's manipulating parts to put human, humans together or fruit flies together. So what we do know from our, our observations in nature is that uh, there's self-assembly processes uh, involved that make complicated objects in nature. So this really actually, uh, this hierarchy of complexity self-assembles from the, from the ground up. And our hope is to use self-assembly as an engineering and manufacturing concept. So instead of having robots putting things together, we're hoping that we can program parts so they would self-assemble and deliver actually what uh, we would like to achieve at the end of the process. Uh, if you look at self-assembly, this is really a fundamentally different way of making things. And uh, hopefully it can deliver complex, complex and three-dimensional uh, final products. It definitely, what, uh, from what we see from nature, it has nanoscale precision, and it can span many orders of magnitude. It also does some of the things that uh, we've never been really able to uh, implement in engineering. Uh, a lot of biological systems can self-reorganize, they can self-heal uh, because they can self-assemble, and if we could uh, engineer also these types of properties, that, that, that would be wonderful. Now, if we would like to build something with self-assembly, if we want to grow a computer uh, similar to, to the way that we grow a plant, um, and as a disclaimer, I have to tell you that we're not there yet. We're taking very small steps in, the, in that direction. We have to be able to answer at least two uh, main questions. One is, uh, where do we get the parts from? 
And the second thing is, how do we tell these parts where to go? How would the part know where it should assemble itself to make this final, final uh, structure? And I'll show you in the next, uh, next few minutes uh, some examples that uh, deal with this uh, problem. We've uh, gotten our parts either from chemical synthesis or solid state microfabrication. And depending on the size of the parts, we can program them uh, with uh, direct chemistries, things uh, similar to covalent bonds or DNA programming, or we may uh, use uh, surface tension forces. And in the next few minutes, it becomes uh, hopefully more uh, uh, clear what these approaches are. So let's look at a few examples of how we have tried to do self-assembly. And we're going to start from very small scale, uh, initially at the atomic scale, and gradually increase the size of the objects that we artificially make. And uh, I have actually a confession to make, and this is that the first example I'm going to show you is actually not a self-assembly uh, example. It's actually a controlled disassembly. So there are two ways that we can make things. We can either put parts together to make a system or do something similar to what a sculptor does. We can take away parts and try to, to make something. And this is, a, I'm sure if you know where this picture is, uh, is from, this is our, uh, our attempt basically to do sculpting as, uh, in, the, in the atomic scale. So what we do is um, we take a wire, and I know a lot of you here are the electrical engineers, and we apply a voltage across this wire. So what's, uh, what's going to happen if we apply a voltage? A current will flow. And we can crank up the voltage slowly, the more current will flow, more current will flow. And what's going to happen if I apply a really large, uh, large voltage? Yeah, this, uh, this uh, wire is going to blow up. So this is a cat catastrophic event, and anyone who's been interested in uh, electrical engineering in the fifth grade probably has experienced that firsthand. Now, we would like to actually do this in a slightly more controllable, controllable fashion. First of all, we're making really tiny wires. So this uh, scale bar here is 90 nanometers. So this is typical, uh, uh, comparable to the size of a virus. We still actually can, can hook up wires to it and pass current. But what we do is that uh, we measure the current that goes through, plus we look at the noise of this current. And this is quite important, because typically we consider noise as something that uh, we need to get rid of. It's an annoyance. It's a bad thing. It turns out, actually, in small scale, noise can carry a lot of information. We actually intelligently, hopefully, use noise uh, to see what happens in nanoscale, things that normally we cannot see. And we use that as a knob, basically, to controllably disintegrate this wire and land at the uh, shape that we want. So if I put this under an electron microscope and look at the progression of what happens to this wire, uh, slowly taking things away and doing our atomic scale sculpting, this is what I, what I see. So this is a section of a slightly larger wire. Uh, it is moving around. Uh, this is after, after the application of voltage. And um, eventually, it would look like this. If I zoom in here, uh, you see that uh, it's only a small uh, portion still connecting the two, two parts of the wire. And even if you continue further, then you'll arrive at the breakage. So you can controllably actually break the structure uh, in a very, very small dimension. So this is only about two, two nanometers or so. So you can actually put a handful, maybe four or five uh, atoms would bridge this gap. Um, so this is something you can do with control, controllable disassembly. Now let's, act, uh, let's go to slightly larger scale and see what we can do with, um, with DNA. This is, DNA is actually quite an, quite an interesting, interesting molecule. So again, because there are a lot of engineers in this, uh, in this uh, uh, audience, I don't need to go, go through this. But for the most part, we know that the language of digital logic is uh, zeros, of, zeros and ones. So this is how we handle information in the digital world. This is how actually your cell phone right now transmits your voice. This is how uh, your hard disk uh, stores information. Everything is turned to a series of uh, ones and zeros. It turns out, actually, that the language of life is uh, it has similarities with this approach. Instead of uh, an alphabet that's made of only ones and zeros, it has an alphabet that's made of uh, four different uh, members. So A, G, C, and T. Now, these are DNA molecules, which are strings of uh, the bases. So this, each one of them is, is called, the, called the base, have interesting properties. One of the interesting properties is that whenever you have a G, uh, it can recognize and uh, preferentially bind to C. Whenever you have an A, it would do the same thing with T. So they can recognize and bind to each other, uh, very good property. 
Also, you can artificially synthesize DNA now. So this uh, art has progressed so much right now that you can uh, go online, type the string of bases that you'd like to have, and order your DNA online. The next uh, morning, it can uh, get delivered with FedEx. Uh, for not a very large cost, it could be just uh, maybe $20, $30. It's an amazing capability that, uh, that's available, available to the public. Now, if we have this, how can we take advantage of this for controllable, controllable assembly? So this is what we do. We, uh, we custom design, actually, strands of DNA with known sequences of bases in them. And then, essentially, we try to cook them as a soup. Uh, basically, this goes to a beaker. You heat it up, and you, you do a few other, other steps. Uh, they're designed, though, that at the end of this process, they can come together and make a specific shape. So what you see on the right side, uh, right side here is a square. So this square is made of uh, eight different strands, and this is completely self-assembled. So you can program the code in these, these DNA molecules, so when they come together, recognize, remember that uh, the bases could recognize each other and bind. Uh, when they hybridize, you can get a geometric, geometric shape. So this is actually a pretty interesting, interesting property. How would this uh, look like in real life? This is an uh, atomic force uh, microscope image of a DNA template, you recognize these, uh, these squares here, uh, which has been completely artificially made from bases. And the scale bar here is about uh, 320 nanometers or so. So you can make these geometric shapes completely from the bottom up. There is no top-down supervision of these processes. These molecules come together and make the shape. And one of our goals is to uh, use DNA templates as a basis for making uh, electronic circuits, integrated circuits. To, uh, to show you one example of uh, how we've gotten a start on this, the, the picture that you see on the left side is, uh, is a wire. So we use this for conducting electricity, but it's a very tiny one. So it's only seven, uh, seven and a half nanometers wide, extremely tiny. And this is built on a viral DNA. So we take the DNA out of a virus and turn this to a metallic wire, and we've measured actually how electricity will go through this wire. So these are the things that uh, we can do right now with DNA. We can also uh, use DNA for programming uh, surfaces. Uh, we have uh, a sizable activity in our department on making uh, uh, optical devices on silicon chips. So this is for laterally actually guiding light on the surface, uh, integrating uh, optical devices with computing. And the way this, uh, these devices are done, they need actually heterogeneous integration. So we need to be able to place nanoscale objects in a controllable way on a surface, and th this is how we do it. So without going into the details of this, we uh, use DNA to program these types of uh, assemblies and make uh, devices that are useful, uh, useful for engineers. Now, we have talked about some, se some self-assembly examples, but you've already noticed the uh, difference be between the world of self-assembly and the world of engineering. So what, when we think about self-assembly, we think about plants, we think about uh, animals, it's a very organic world. And when we think about the engineering world, we're thinking about steel, we're thinking of silicon, uh, we're thinking about uh, copper. There seems to be a, quite a distance, actually, between these two worlds. And uh, the question is, how do we bridge these two worlds and uh, bring them together? And it turns out, actually, there are good examples in nature for making, making this bridge. And one of them relates to a bacteria that had puzzled people for a long time. So this bacteria has a very odd property. Uh, it can, uh, similar to a compass, it can show you where the North Pole is. It aligns itself, actually, to the magnetic field of the Earth. So if you bring a magnet, these uh, bacteria also respond. And for the longest time, people were absolutely puzzled by the behavior of this bacteria. How would the bacteria know where, the, where North is? And this uh, puzzle was uh, not solved until somebody actually took one of the, uh, this bacteria, put it, put it under a transmission electron microscope to see what's inside. And what they observed was that the bacteria actually can synthesize magnetite, the magnetic material, and put it in, in a needle-shaped uh, structure. So this is really actually self-assembling compass from the ground up. The bacteria does it in itself. So this is by itself is interesting, but also uh, I would like to draw your attention that the bacteria is making a very inorganic material. It's making uh, iron oxide. And we have many examples of uh, various organisms uh, 
building inorganics in nature. So here are a couple of other examples. Uh, this is very familiar to all of us. Our bones and teeth. These are uh, fairly inorganic structures made by uh, a very natural, natural process. So nature can do it. Uh, the picture in the center is even more interesting than that. This is from a sea sponge. And what this uh, sea sponge does is uh, that it makes uh, silicon dioxide. Essentially, it makes glass. So if you think of the processes that are used to make glass, very high temperature uh, for semiconductor uh, uh, fabrication. If you would like to make silicon dioxide, you're dealing with very corrosive uh, environments also. But this sea sponge makes glass in sea, at sea, at, uh, at room temperature, neutral pH, very gentle environments. So we have quite a few examples of uh, natural, natural phenomena here offering us inorganic structures. Now the problem is, I'm not aware of any bacteria that can make a computer. So unfortunately, we don't have an example of that, or an airplane, or deal with materials that we are very interested in. So can I uh, re-engineer these natural effects to get what I want? Can I make them uh, to make a transistor? Well, in order to do, to do this, we have to understand, first of all, how nature does what it does. So how does nature make the beautiful structure on the right side? That's the structure of, uh, of the tooth. It's actually from a mouse, not a human, but similar. So how does nature do it? The short answer is, we don't quite know. The slightly longer answer is, we have some good ideas what's going on there. So these are very complicated, actually, biochemical processes. Uh, we know that there are a lot of pathways involved here, and lots of molecules actually uh, cooperate to make these uh, very complicated structures. So even though we don't have a comprehensive view of how things happen in nature, we have some idea. And what we do know is that uh, proteins play a critical role in all of these processes. So in order to do this, we have to be able to engineer proteins that do what we want them to do. Now, can I engineer a protein to do an arbitrary function that I'm interested in? Unfortunately, again, the answer is no. Our uh, knowledge of uh, proteins and protein engineering has not advanced enough uh, to do this. So we have actually decided to na narrow the scope of this work a little bit and see maybe we can find at least proteins that can recognize and bind to materials that are of interest to an engineer. Can I do this? Can I find a protein that would uh, bind to gold? So maybe then I can use that protein for growing a gold structure. Um, do we have most of these proteins uh, occurring naturally? No, we don't. So we have to find a way uh, to identify these proteins. So how do we do this? There's a, there's a trick in a uh, genetic engineer, engineering play to identify these proteins. So this is how it's done. You take a virus, and in this particular virus, this is M M13, it is, uh, it is known that, remember that we, we said that the language of uh, uh, biology was uh, the DNA. So this is how information is coded in biological systems. So in the DNA of this, uh, this virus, it's known what section determines the sequence of uh, a particular prote protein. So what we do is that we start with a random library of uh, oligonucleotides, it's a random library of DNA. Then uh, we can put this in the, in the genome of the, of the virus, recreate the, the viruses. So now I have a random library of viruses. And then I can actually see which one of these uh, viruses would uh, attach to the material that I'm interested in. So maybe a few of them will, will attach. And then I can take that virus, uh, put it in a bacteria. This is how you am amplify it. So you copy the, copy the virus multiple times. You repeat this experiment many times. And uh, at the end of the day, you end up, even though you start with maybe one billion different types of virus, you end up with maybe three that are very selectively binding to what, uh, what you're interested in. And then all you need to do is to, uh, to open the virus, read the DNA that has gone into this, and see what the sequence of the uh, amino acids was. So you can identify the polypeptide or the protein. So then you don't need to deal with genetic engineering anymore. You can directly make that protein. So we're uh, basically playing a trick here with biology to do the job for us, instead of us trying one billion different uh, proteins. And uh, there's a sizable effort, actually, at the College of Engineering here at the University of Washington basically doing this. Uh, and many of these uh, polypeptides, these are shorter versions of uh, proteins, have already been identified. So this is an example for, for gold, platinum, palladium. And we've actually used them 
for a guiding assembly in a nanoscale. So this is an actual picture of how these things may look like. We have a nanoscale object, so it's about 10 nanometers. This is about, a, about 10 times smaller than a virus. And we've actually programmed this uh, object to land on a known location on a surface with these, uh, uh, with these polypeptides, the actual sequence of the peptide that uh, does, the, does the programming. So this way we can actually make a bridge between the inorganic world of uh, steel and copper and silicon and the organic world of uh, proteins, and proteins and peptides. So here are a few examples of nanoscale assembly. I would like to show you um, one example of uh, micron scale self-assembly. So this is self-assembling much larger uh, structure. So we're not talking about self-assembling a bridge, still it's in the, in the domain of microsystems, but something that uh, with normal techniques we can never build. And this is a device that we are quite actually interested in. It relates to contact lenses and making a functional contact lens. So as, uh, just out of curiosity, anyone here uses contact lenses? If you could, uh, okay, a few. So you're, you're familiar, most actually at the back of the hall. I don't know what, why that is. But, um, so contact lenses have been around for, for some time. Uh, they're relatively straightforward uh, polymer structures, plastic structures, they, they correct vision. What we're interested in is to convert uh, co contact lenses to functional systems. Remember we talked about iPhone? That's a full, uh, fun fully functional system. Does a lot of different things. Can I convert the contact lens to do lots of different things? So what kind of things are we interested in? We're interested in information display and we're interested in healthcare applications for contact lenses. In terms of uh, information display, wouldn't it be interesting if you could uh, make a contact lens that had a computer display already in it? So you can walk around and see information and superimpose the uh, computer-generated image onto what you would normally see. So this, this clearly has applications in, uh, in gaming, but also if, if someday somebody can uh, create a high-resolution image, definitely has, uh, has implications in augmented reality. Uh, so normally, maybe you'd walk around, if you're wearing one of these contact lenses, this is what uh, you would normally see. It's not actually a picture of uh, a street in old Leon, but uh, in the augmented reality uh, scenario, maybe your contact lens would uh, alter your vision. So you can create different types of realities for people who are present at, in the same, same location, depending on uh, what the computer program uh, is, uh, is chartered to do. So these are, these are this, uh, some of the display applications of a, of a functional contact lens. What's uh, really interesting uh, is the healthcare application of contact lenses, functional contact lenses. So it's something that we normally don't think about, but if you look at the surface of the human eye, this surface is covered by live cells. So at any given moment, as you're seeing the outside world, what's going on is light actually going through some live cells entering your eye and you detect, uh, detect that light. So these live cells on the, on the surface of the human cornea, have, they have to be kept alive so they're in, in uh, indirect contact with the blood serum. So what this translates to is that what happens on the surface of the eye to a degree is a reflection of what's happening inside the body. Now when we go to a doctor, uh, the doctor would order, order a blood run. What happens is that the blood uh, sample is taken, an analysis is performed on this blood, blood sample, and maybe you look at some indicators, maybe you check cholesterol, you check uh, glucose, it turns out a lot of these indicators actually show up on the surface of the eye. So if you could monitor that on the surface of the eye, you don't have to take a blood test. But you do need a contact lens that's quite sophisticated. It has to have sensors, has to have computing, has to be able to relay the information out through a small radio. So it has to do a lot of stuff. We have a lot of expectations for this, this contact lens. And the question is, how do we build these really tiny components? And then how do we put them together to make a functional contact lens? So in terms of uh, tiny components, especially for healthcare, the first thing that we need is biosensors. So can we make very, very small biosensors? And the answer is yes. This is uh, one example of our group's work. This is a sensor that we've tried for uh, detection of various DNA, proteins, and ions. And uh, the, the size scale here is about 50 nanometers. That means that if you look at the whole uh, sensor structure here, you can fit about 100 of these uh, sensors inside one white blood cell. So this is how small they are. So we can make very tiny biosensors. We need uh, controlled circuitry 
for uh, this contact lens. And uh, this is something that we can't, unfortunately, build on plastic. So we, we've developed processes to make uh, very small silicon controlled circuit components. Uh, and basically what we do is that we, we start with a flat semiconductor wafer, we go through a series of parallel processes, and we create our devices. They're all built on a sacrificial layer, so once we really, uh, etch the sacrificial layer, all these, uh, these components come off. Uh, at the end of the day, we get something uh, similar to what's uh, shown on the left side here. So if you look at this vial, tiny vial, to unsus uh, an unsuspecting eye, this looks like a, a normal chemical. But this is not a chemical. So if you put this powder under microscope, you will see various shapes. These are functional devices. So these are silicon uh, circuit components with all the electrical connections and everything else that you need to run circuitry. So we can make this powder type material that is a functional circuit. For our lens, we need uh, light sources. So we've designed also micron scale light sources. And this is how they look like in real life. So they emit uh, bright uh, uh, red light, very, very tiny. And uh, photodetectors. Again, what uh, you see in this picture, in this vial, is not a chemical in, in water. It's a collection of functional photodetectors released. So these, these specs are actually functional, functional devices. So now we have all these parts. They're all made in incompatible processes. I have detectors. I have light sources. I have transistors. I have biosensors. So how do I put this together, and how do I make, uh, make a contact lens out of these things? So this is actually where self-assembly uh, comes in, into the picture. It turns out it's simpler than uh, what uh, you originally thought. So this is how we do the self-assembly, pretty straightforward. We make a template, usually out of plastic, that has all the electrical interconnects. And on the, on the template, we have uh, receptor sites with particular shapes. We have a series of components that we're interested in assembling on this template. Uh, we, we do everything as a solution. We introduce the parts. The parts flow uh, uh, past the binding sites. If the shapes match, they fall in, and they make a capillary bond, and we're done. Very, very simply, actually, this is, uh, this is done in a solution. This is a side view of the same thing. So you have a binding site here. A component comes in, falls into the right location, and, uh, and you're done with the self-assembly. As I said, our components uh, look like this. So this is a, a, a powder type uh, collection of functional components. And on the left side, you see a typical, typical plastic, uh, plastic template. Here you see an empty template. And on the right side, you can see this template being uh, populated by small, small components. So we've done a lot of these, uh, these tests. And uh, this is how they look like. This is an example of a, of a template with 10,000 binding sites. So you can do a lot of these components fairly, fairly quickly and place them in the right location. So now we have all the micro components that we wanted. And now we have a technique also to put these components on very unconventional substrates, like plastic. So we can now put the whole thing together and uh, make contact lenses. So this is um, our first generation prototype uh, on, on the left side. And we've done actually passive tests of these, uh, these devices on, on rabbits. This is a standard uh, in ophthalmology to make sure that uh, they're safe. And fortunately, they've all been quite safe to, to, this, uh, to this date. So we've never seen any adverse effects in any of our tests. It's an ongoing, ongoing uh, program. I have a little movie here. Uh, I don't know actually how well this will show up on the, on the screen. But this is an actual contact lens, so it's, uh, it's somewhat dark, so it's hard, to, hard for you to see. But you can see the edge of the contact lens. And I would like you to look at one of the optical, uh, optoelectronic components here on the contact lens. So it's, it's, again, I apologize, it's very difficult to see. But these devices are also very difficult, uh, difficult to image. So you can see, I don't know if the red here shows or not, but uh, this is what the person, uh, person would see would uh, wear this contact lens. And if you pay attention to where the finger is pointing, you will see the light coming on. So the light has been turned on, and then it's, it's turned off. And then we turn on the environmental, and the environmental light. So this is uh, where we are with our uh, contact lenses uh, today. So you know, this, uh, <laughs> um, this has been of interest to, to a variety of uh, people. Uh, no res disrespect meant to the, to the governor. Of, uh, of California, and uh, so but people have been actually thinking of various, uh, various applications of what you could do if you had access to this type of technology, if you could put various type of, uh, types of uh, small devices on, uh, on a contact lens. And what we've demonstrated so far is that with self-assembly, you can actually do that. 
Uh, this is from Daily Telegraph uh, from, from January. And uh, what they had was that maybe you walk around and see your new email. Maybe you can connect GPS and get directions directly on your contact lens as you move around. I'm not sure if you really want to see the temperature uh, all the time on, uh, in front of your eyes, but, uh, but it's a, at least an option. Um, and you know, one, one other th last thing I uh, wanted to point, I wanted to make about, the, about contact lenses, and it's not just about contact lenses, it's, it's about work ongoing at the College of uh, Engineering at the university here, is that uh, our work and uh, other work that uh, is ongoing in the, in the college has been um, reported on and noticed uh, globally, actually, uh, in, in a pretty, a pretty uh, wide, uh, wide scale. So particularly for these contact lenses, They've been uh, put on display in the London Museum of Science actually this year. So we had a dedicated display of, uh, of this work. And as uh, uh, Dean O'Donnell mentioned, uh, this, this particular work was uh, also chosen as one of the best inventions of the year 2008 by the Time magazine. Uh, we've had reports on, uh, on these pretty much from every single uh, uh, news, news outlet. Um, I think the, the, the college actually has been an incredible uh, resource uh, uh, for, for all of us, especially for faculty, because uh, we are supported by the college, but I hope also for the, for the broader community in the, in the Seattle area, in the state of uh, Washington, and, and the industry. So this has uh, definitely been, uh, uh, at least uh, for, for my group, a, a pleasure to be, to, be a part, to be able to be a, a part of this uh, program. Um, so with that, I'm getting close to the, to the conclusion of my presentation. Uh, so what we did was, uh, if you look at the past, uh, past few minutes, what we, we talked about, we looked at uh, where we started in manufacturing, how things have developed, and we identified some of the needs of uh, possible manufacturing techniques. What is it that we might need in the next 10, 20, 30 years? And uh, one of our suggestions has been that perhaps we should look at natural processes and learn about self-assembly, and maybe self-assembly would be the way that we make things in the future. So by no means I'm saying that we're going to be able to grow microprocessors and trees uh, in the next uh, two, three years, but uh, definitely the area is, uh, is of uh, interest. And lastly, I wanted to uh, say a couple of words of why we do this. So this is work that is uh, very exhausting, actually. It, uh, it requires working at midnight and working over weekends and spending a lot of money. So, so why do we do all of this? And for me, I would say the main application is healthcare. So if I can someday use all the technologies that we're developing in healthcare in a meaningful way to, to help people living, uh, living better lives, I think then I would call our program a successful one. Um, our work is, uh, is done by a number of people. Th these are people in my group. Uh, we have close collaborations with, uh, with people at our university, and uh, a lot of people also contribute financially to our work. Thank you very much for your attention.